Hello, Canyon Hills. My name is Dave, and I'm one of the pastors here. We know every Sunday we have people attending our church for the very first time. If that's you, I just want to say welcome. We're glad you're here. We would love to get to know you a little bit and have you get to know us. There's a few ways you can do that. First, you can stop by the Information Center in the lobby. The people there would love to meet you and answer any questions you might have. You can also scan the QR code on the seat in front of you or head over to the I'm New tab on our website to find out a little bit more about us. Again, if this is your first time, welcome. If you're here today at the 9.30 or 11 a.m. service, believe it or not, in the next few minutes, the room is gonna fill up. In order to make room for everyone, please fill in the seats in the middle of the row so that there's room for everyone. Thanks for your help with that. We want you to know that our next night of worship is this coming Friday, October 27th. We hope you can join us at seven o'clock for a great evening of praise, worship, and prayer. These are some of my favorite nights of the year. Also, if you've been attending Canyon Hills for a while now and aren't a member yet, I wanted to let you know that our next membership class is this coming Saturday morning, October 28th at nine o'clock. This is an opportunity to learn more about our core beliefs, values, and next steps to becoming a member. Pastor Steve teaches this class and does a great job. You can sign up for the membership class on our app or website. And lastly, for anyone who's done counseling and ever felt like you were hitting a dead end, I want to invite you to our next counseling symposium, Friday, November 3rd, and Saturday, November 4th. We'll have one of the best biblical counselors in the country, Randy Patton, here to address the topic, Counseling Failure Factors, Why Counseling Fails and What Counselors Should Do When They Get Stuck. You can also register for this on our app or website. I think that's it for now. Thank you for joining us today. What a blessing it is for us to gather together as the body of Christ. All right, good morning, friends. Welcome to church. We're glad that you are here. Um, the verse that has been on my heart as I've been preparing for today is one that we all probably know and love. Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, but in all your ways. Um, acknowledge Him and He will make straight your path. And you know, just as I've been in this new season of life, I'm a new mom and there's a lot of new dynamics, uncharted territories, and it seems like now more than ever, I've really needed to take my focus off of the here and now and all the things in front of me and place it back on Jesus where it belongs. And I know that for many of us, for all of us, we walked into this place facing different things, different life circumstances, different things vying for our attention. But my challenge and my encouragement for us all today is that we would lay those things at the feet of Jesus and that we would draw our attention and our affection back onto Him and trust that the Lord of Lords, the King of Kings, the Creator, the Sustainer, the Sovereign One is in control. He is trustworthy. When we don't understand, we trust that He understands. And when we don't see a way, we trust that He is going before us and making a way. So. And that's what we're gonna do. We invite you to stand to your feet. We're gonna be faithful in the time that we have together in offering him the praise and the worship that he deserves. So come on. So lift it up together. Mm. We could be anywhere, anywhere, but you have us right here. Quiet hearts, help us be still. Open our hands for you to come fill. We could be anywhere, anywhere, but you have us right here. God, you have us right here. Be glorified in everything we do, everything we say. Be glorified in the songs we sing. Be our prayer for this gathering. Hey. Oh. Yes, that's our prayer. Church. We 
scripture again out of Proverbs chapter 3 it says this trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding and if you're anything like I am sometimes you do a good job of trusting the Lord with all your heart in one circumstance and then the very next moment you find yourself trusting in your own understanding and your own strength in another circumstance and so today what I want us to do is maybe identify one or two things that you know in your life right now that you are trusting in your own strength on, that you're trusting in your own understanding. And maybe this thing you realize, I've never even asked God's help for this thing. Has that ever happened to you where you realize you're going through a struggle and you go, oh, maybe I should pray about this. So identify one or two things that you know right now you're trusting in your own understanding and bring those before the Lord. Go ahead and do that right now. those things to the Lord let's read the second part of the scripture it says in all your ways acknowledge him and he will make your straight make straight your paths so what I want you to do is take those one or two things that you've failed to trust in the Lord in and I want you to commit those things to him and say Lord I'm trusting in you I'm relying on you for these things I need you for these things go ahead and do that Father, we are sorry that so often we turn to our own strength and our own wisdom before we even turn to you. And so, Lord, we want to take these moments, these few moments here to recalibrate our hearts and our minds towards you. We want to trust in you with all of our heart, not just part of it. We want to lean on you because we need you and Lord we know that you'll make our path straight Lord you didn't say that they would be an easy path but it would be a straight path and so Lord would you give us the strength to walk that path that narrow path 
We pray in Christ's name. Amen. We're creation, suddenly articulate with a thousand tongues to lift one cry. Then from north to south and east to west, we hear cry. so good you are so kind you're sovereign you're in control Lord and we thank you that you are a God that goes before us and makes a way you're a God that is in control you're a God 
that sees the bigger picture, a God that we can trust in. Lord, we thank you for the love that you pour out on us. We thank you that there is freedom and rest in that. There is hope in that. We love you, and it's in your precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can have a seat. Good morning, everyone. Uh, I want you to get your Bibles out and open to 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. Uh, today, we continue in our series that we have titled Stand Firm, in which we are calling ourselves to contend for God's truth in a broken world. This idea that we want to be looking at our society, we want to be looking at our world through the lens of Scripture, not through the lens of culture. The hope for this series is that it would allow us to build a biblical foundation on which we can build our lives. And today, the truth that we are contending for is God's desire for us in our sexuality. God's call on us when it comes to sex. Now, uh, if you are a parent of small children, you probably got an email at some point in time during this week, um, just reminding you that we have a great child, ch child care program here at the church. Um, and the reason we're sharing that with you is not because there's gonna be anything explicit or inappropriate shared from the stage here today, um, but we just recognize there might be conversations that you wanna have one-on-one -on -one with your kid that you don't wanna have to follow up on because the idiot on stage said something that you weren't ready for. Um, <laughs> So just context in that, you know, my oldest child is 13, my second oldest is 11, neither one of them are sitting in church today, um, just because there's certain things that we want to follow up with them one-on-one. -on -one. So uh, if you're here and you do have that kid that you want to put in childcare, we've extended that childcare check-in for a couple minutes. If you have them here and you're cool with them being in here, that's great. Like you're, They're more than welcome. We just don't want to ambush you as the parents and make that decision for you. So... Um, this would normally be the part of the message where I would tell you some sort of story or give you some sort of illustration to try and engage you with the topic at hand. Um, typically on days like this, that's not necessary. Um, the minute someone says sex in a microphone, everyone's attention locks in pretty quickly. But this is a really important topic for us to, do, to address because it seems that there's this pretty aggressive degradation within our society that has been taking place over the last few years. Our society has been sexualized on a deep level. Things have changed. I don't know if you remember what it was like when you were a kid, but like for me, um, you couldn't come across pornography unless you were working pretty hard or pretty intentional about finding it, right? It's not something that you would just stumble across. Flash forward to 2023, did you know that the average age of exposure to pornography is now 12? And that's just the average. That's not when kids come in contact with, that's just kind of the average number. It's no longer something that, or it has become something that you can just stumble across. It's led to real ramifications within people's homes. Like for us, um, one of my greatest prayers for my children in this season of life is that they would be spared from the sexual depravity that runs rampant in our society. We've gotten to a place where we don't allow them to have any sort of internet on their devices, not because we don't trust them, but because there's an entire industry in our society built around trying to hook them in and sexualize them from a young age. This last year, we got to the point where we don't, we don't even let our kids watch Christian YouTube channels without us in the room. Again, not because there's anything objectionable coming up in the channel. It's the ads that YouTube allows to pop up in front of them that put images and ideas and words in their heads that is just not appropriate for them at this age. Society no longer sees sex as something that is holy or something um, that is sanctified. It is something that is purely biological, something that is recreational, and something that in most cases is depicted with a certain amount of selfishness. So the question for us today becomes, what does God expect of us in our sexuality? What is his design for sex? Is it for us? Is it about our pleasure or is it possible that it is about something that is far greater. My hope for today as we look to the scriptures is that we would gain clarity as to what God's desire is for us in our sexuality. 
that we would be, better be able to see clearly through the lies that have been told to us to better understand what it is that God would call us to contend for in this sin-broken world. So with your Bibles open, would you stand with me out of respect for the word of God as we read together 1 Thessalonians beginning in, chapter, or beginning in verse 4. Chapter 4, verse 1. Sorry, we're in third service now. Things are going to get dicey. <laughs> Finally then, brothers... We ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. For you know what instructions we gave you through the Lord Jesus. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for today. We are grateful for the privilege that it is that we get to come together to look to your word and ultimately, Lord, to be changed by you. I pray that you would give us ears to hear your word. I pray that you give us hearts that would be ready to change, that we would be the kind of people that walk out of this place in half an hour looking more and more like your son, Jesus. It's in Christ's name that we pray these things. Amen. You can be seated. All right, so big idea for today is this. God's highest desire regarding our sexuality is not that we would be happy. His highest desire is that we would be holy. God's plan for us, that which he is calling for us to contend for is much bigger than simply our pleasure or our satisfaction or our gratification. God's greatest desire for us in our sexuality is that we would bring it in and under the banner of all of Christian life, which is holiness above all things. A quick little point of clarification before we dive into this. Um, today, our topic is very narrowly focused on sexuality. We're going to touch a little bit on um, gender. We're going to touch a little bit on marriage, but that's not primarily what today is about. There are other sermons coming in this series that are going to uh, deal with those things more directly. I share that with you because as you leave, you might think, I wonder why he didn't say fill in the blank, or I wonder why he didn't say more about this over here, that's why. We're kind of trying to stay in our lanes um, to best utilize our time in this series. But um, point number one for us today is this, under our big idea. God is calling us to a sanctified sexual life. Whether in singleness or in marriage, God's call on our lives is that we would be sanctified and made holy. The message of the gospel is not, nor has it ever been, come as you are and then stay that way. That God, through Jesus, has, an ex has extended an invitation to every person. He is willing to take us as we are, praise God, but he loves us far too much to allow us to stay that way. Verse three of our text says, for this is the will of God, your sanctification, more specifically, that you would abstain from sexual immorality. Sanctification is a word that simply describes the process of being separated from our sin and being set apart to God's holiness. It's the Holy Spirit empowered process by which we become less and less of who we once were and become more and more like the people we are supposed to be. And this, uh, this process, it's not an overnight process. Right? Like anyone in the room can testify to this truth. The day after you gave your life to Christ, you didn't wake up as this perfect, holy, and complete person. Right? It's a day by day journey. It's something that we have to work towards. Anyone in this room who cannot or will not testify to that truth is either a liar or severely self-deceived. But while this is a process, we also have to understand that the sanctification process in a Christian's life, it is never absent in the life of a true follower of Jesus. The person who has given their life to Christ will inevitably be changed. There's a process. We can observe this. We can see the fruit in a person's life who is following Christ. So a key text in this idea of sanctification is 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 9 through 11, in which Paul writes, or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? That's a clear and simple statement of truth. But he follows that up by saying, do not be deceived, meaning we have this propensity to believe a lie that runs contrary to that simple truth. So Paul gets even more specific. Do not be deceived. 
Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor the greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And here's what we have to see. It says, and such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the spirit of our God. Now, the operative word in this text here is were. Such were some of you. This is who we once were before Christ intervened. When someone genuinely comes to faith in Christ, their sanctification is inevitable. Our lives will begin to bear fruit in keeping with repentance. Pastor Steve has said often from this pulpit, faith that isn't changing you isn't likely saving you. When we are adopted into the family of God, We are called to leave behind the world's standard of living and we are called to a new standard of holiness. Now, a little sidebar here. Um, This message is obviously not just about heterosexuality versus homosexuality. This is a much bigger and much broader topic than that. However, because of the depravity of our society and because of this move within the broader church to move towards this position of accepting homosexuality as a God-honoring lifestyle, I feel like it has to be said very briefly and very clearly. Homosexuality is a sin. It is impossible to live in unrepentant homosexuality and honor Christ with your life. They are mutually exclusive. However, with that said, in light of 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we would do well to remember that it is a sin. It is not the sin. Right? The message of this passage of scripture is that any unrepentant sinner will not inherit the kingdom of God. The ground is level at the foot of the cross. So it doesn't matter whether or not that unrepentant sin is that of greed or that of adultery or that of thievery. It doesn't matter if that sin is sex outside of marriage with someone of the same sex, of the opposite sex, or just having sex with oneself in front of a computer screen. All sin requires the same shed blood of the sinless son of God. And so the call for every unrepentant sinner is the same. It's a call to holiness. To the adulterer, the call is holiness. To the thief, the call is holiness. To the greedy, the call is holiness. And listen, to the person struggling with homosexuality, the call is not to heterosexuality. The call is to holiness. The invitation is the same. Come as you are and allow Christ to change you. So no matter what your background, no matter what the decisions of your life may be up to this point, you need to know that you are welcome here. Like where else would we want unrepentant sinners to be than right here in church? You're in good company. Look around you. But the call is not to come and stay the same. The call is to come and to be changed. The call is to come to look more like Jesus, to take on his holiness. Now, I believe when it comes to our sexuality, there are only two categories into which we can biblically fall. Either we are single, which means we have no spouse, or we are married. Um, And I don't want to step on Pastor Steve's message for next week on marriage. But when we say marriage, we are talking about a holy covenant made before God between one man and one woman. That is all we are given. So as single people, God is not first and foremost concerned about our happiness. He is first and foremost concerned about our holiness. And he has called you to a sanctified single life. And a holy sanctified single life is a chaste life. And the idea and concept of chastity, neither of these things are popular in today's culture, either inside the church or outside of the church, but this is what we are called to. It's the abstention of any sexual activity. This includes things like watching pornography, masturbation, any form of sex outside of marriage, anything that would stir up in us an ungodly sexual longing. That is the directive we are given, and we'll get to the why behind that directive shortly. So as followers of Jesus, if you're not single, then you're married. As married people, just as before, God is not primarily concerned about your happiness. He is primarily concerned about your holiness. You have been called to a sanctified married life, and a sanctified married life is a faithful life. 
It is a complete and total commitment to the covenant that has been made before God. And again, I don't want to step on Pastor Steve's message for next weekend, but contrary to what our society would propagate, marriage is not first and foremost about attraction. Marriage is not first and foremost about your quote unquote being in love. Both of these things are good and merciful gifts from God. But first and foremost, marriage is a commitment made before God to represent the kind of love that Christ has for his church. And it is in the context of this union that all sexual expression and activity is to be confined. Hebrews 13, four, let marriage be held in honor among all and let the marriage bed be undefiled for God will judge the sexually immoral and adulterous. God is calling us to a sanctified sexual life. That's point number one. Point number two is this. God is calling us to live differently than the world. We as Christians are meant to be set apart. That's what holiness is. We aren't to blend in, but instead we are to stand out. We're to be a testimony both to our faith and to our God. Look back at our text in verse three. Paul writes this. For this is the will of God, your sanctification, that you abstain from sexual immorality, that each one of you know how to control his own body in holiness and honor. And here it is, not in the passion of lust like the Gentiles who do not know God. And church, honestly, I think this is where maybe we start to get into a little bit of trouble. I think this is where it maybe gets real for a few more of us here in the room. Because the truth is, um, if you are a follower of Jesus, if you've been a Christian for any length of time, nothing I've said up to this point should be shocking to you. Right? Like you may not have explained it in the exact same way, but for the most part, you'd be able to nod your head along and go, yes, I understand. This is what the scriptures call us to, that we are to be sanctified in our sexual life, that we are to live separately from the world. The problem is that we, and I don't just mean Canyon Hills Community Church, I mean the church at large, have done a terrible job of actually contending for these things. Like so many areas of the Christian life, we are quick to let it penetrate our minds, but we resist it allowing it to penetrate our hearts. We will contend violently for things publicly that we do not contend for privately. We'll sign a petition in the lobby. We'll cast our ballots in support of the sanctity of marriage. We will sign legislation to keep our children from being sexualized at a young age by these scholastic institutions. States will sign laws to make it harder for porn to be accessible to children and put some kind of accountability in place for these satanic and hedonistic organizations. And yet, when we look at the statistics on a personal level, we don't look all that much different. 47% of families in the United States report that pornography is a problem in their home. 47%. That's not 47% of the people outside of the church. That includes us. Regardless of the known consequence, did you know that statistically speaking, pornography use increases the marital infidelity rate by more than 300%. Which means the couple that struggles with pornography is more than 300% more likely to end their marriage in divorce than a couple that doesn't. And that makes total sense, right? The more we think about infidelity, the more we view infidelity, the more we fantasize about infidelity, the more likely we are to actually commit a physical act of infidelity. And yet 68% of church-going men And this kills me. Even 50% of pastors view porn on a regular basis. We know the destruction that it causes. We know the effects that it has. And yet of Christian men, 18 to 24 years old, 76% actively look at porn. And this used to be just a predominantly male issue, but that's not what the statistics bear out anymore. Only 13% of self-identified Christian women say that they never watch porn. Which means 87% of Christian women have watched porn. And listen, none of, this, none of these stats even touch on the equally detrimental behaviors such as reading explicit romance novels or watching shows on our streaming platforms that may not be pornographic in their entirety, but they certainly are in segments. 
And I share this with you today because we need to understand this is not an issue for all of those people outside of the four walls of this church. This is a church issue. This is a this room issue, men and women. And my fear is we see statistics like this and we allow ourselves to excuse it because, hey, everybody does it. It's not that big of a deal. It is a big deal. 300% more likely to end in divorce. Marriages are being destroyed. Relationships are being destroyed. Our own holiness is being eroded by us. So listen, we should absolutely be contending for holiness on a broad social and legal level, but gosh, we had better do it with humility. Because to a watching world, to our own spouses, to our own children, those statistics are our testimony. We have to start by looking at ourselves and pursuing holiness on a personal level before we could ever truly pursue it on a national level. It has to begin here. It has to begin in the church. It should begin in our church. God's highest desire regarding our sexuality is not that we would be happy. His highest desire is that we would be holy, that we would lead sanctified sexual lives and that we would look different than the rest of the world. Why? Point number three. Because this is what pleases God. Verse one of our text. Finally then, brothers, we ask and urge you in the Lord Jesus that as you receive from us how you ought to walk, and here it is, and to please God, just as you are doing, that you do so more and more. Now that may seem a little bit anticlimactic, right? Like you're telling me I'm supposed to live this sexually sanctified life, that I'm supposed to live differently than the world for no other reason than it makes God happy? Yes. Because that is the banner under which all of our Christian lives fall. 2 Corinthians 5, 9, whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. In other words, whether we are on this earth or whether we are in heaven with Christ, our chief end is to honor and obey and glorify him. But while that's true, there's more to it than this. While it is true that this is what pleases God, we also need to understand that God is the one who wants the best things for us. Right? God doesn't want to just give us good gifts. God wants to give us the best gifts. There's this view of God put forward by people who do not love him that would say that God is this cosmic ogre in the sky, that his sole purpose in existence is to withhold good things from his church. But that's not true. That is not true the God that the Bible paints a picture of. That is not the God of this passage. In fact, Jesus said it most succinctly, I think in John chapter 10, verse 10, when he says, the thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and that they would have it abundantly. So the question we have to wrestle with, and that is, do we believe that what God is calling us to is better than the things that the world would promise to us? That's what's at stake here. Because the world would tell us that we deserve sex. That sex is all about our pleasure, our satisfaction. That what we do with our bodies, man, it's neutral. It's neither harmful nor beneficial. That our sexuality can even be our identity. That who you desire sexually can define who you are. My question is, how's that working out for everyone? And again, not just outside of the church, so many of us have bought into this same ideology while wearing the name Christian. But look at our society. What has this view of sex actually given us? We are a dissatisfied and lonely society who has created a porn industry that generates more money annually than the NFL, NBA, and MLB combined. Our society has reduced sex to pleasure and biology. The marriage rates in our country have been declining since the dawn of the sexual revolution. That is not a coincidence. Today, over 50% of first marriages end in divorce. We're told that if we allow our sexuality to become our identity, finally we will thrive when the reality is that the suicide rate of the LGBTQ plus identifying adolescent population is four times that of the national average. The thief, the evil one, and the lies that he stands behind 
They aren't there for our benefit. They certainly don't make our lives any better. The thief has come to steal and to kill and to destroy. Jesus came that we may have life and have it abundantly. Listen, I don't think we get the chance to say this often enough from the pulpit. Jesus wants you to be satisfied in your sex life. I mean, read the Song of Solomon. Sex is a good and beautiful gift from God. But listen, he doesn't want you settling for the cheap imitation that the world is peddling. He wants you to enjoy this good gift to its fullest, at its absolute best. He wants you to be chased in your singleness to protect you from giving yourself away to someone who will not love you or care for you in the way that he would have you loved and cared for. He wants you to enter marriage without the ghosts of past sexual experiences haunting your marriage bed. God would see you protected from the unrealistic and ungodly expectations that come with viewing or reading about other people having sex. God would desire that the only images in your head when it comes to your sexuality is your own spouse, naked and unashamed, free from comparison, free from sinful expectation and free from regret. God would see you not using each other for selfish selfish gratification, but to see you satisfied as you serve one another Like that's one of the greatest gifts within marriage is that I as the husband no longer have to be the champion of my own pleasure. I have a wife who champions my pleasure for me and vice versa. My wife no longer has to be the champion of her own pleasure. She has a husband whose highest end is her pleasure. And I don't say that to be crass. I say that to say when Jesus said it is better to give than to receive, it applies even to our sex life. Sex is at its absolute best when it is not an end in and of itself, but it is a passionate, pleasure-filled outworking of a committed and covenantal relationship where there is no shame, where there is no embarrassment, where there is no discontentment, but instead honesty, confidence, and care. Listen, God is a truth teller or he's a liar. Either his way is the best way or it's not. That's something that each one of us have to wrestle with. What are we going to choose to believe? And then what are we gonna, how are we going to live like it's true? One last thing in this before we move on. Um, some of you in the room here today are single. And some of you are going to stay single for the rest of your life. I want you to hear this really clearly. God's highest gift to you is not sex and it's not marriage. God's best for your life is not limited to sex or marriage. We know this because in heaven there is no sex and there is no marriage. And that's not because God is withholding a good thing from his people for all of eternity. It's because everything we experience in this life is just a shadow of the substance. Right? What we experience here is meant to just point us to what is coming. So as marriage is the picture of Christ's covenantal love for the church, when we go to heaven, we get to live in that covenantal love in real time. Sex is a good and merciful gift of God, but it is only meant to be a shadow of the intimacy that we will one day enjoy with Christ. And so I share that with you because there's this temptation to allow a root of bitterness to gain ground in your heart when you believe that God has withheld from you a good gift that you deserve. Don't allow your hearts and minds to get so focused on what you don't have in this life that you forget what's been promised in the one to come. I believe the desire for sex and the desire for marriage are good and godly desires, but truly they are just a longing for heaven in disguise. We live this sanctified sexual life separated from the world because it pleases God and he wants what is best for us. In a moment, we'll get to the application of what we're supposed to do with this. But before we do, I just want to give us a little bit of hope. I think there's probably primarily two groups of people present in the room today. There's one group that 
You have contended for holiness in your sex life. You have contended for holiness in your sexuality, whether that's your whole life or just a portion of your life. If that's you, praise God, you should keep doing what you're doing. I hope you are recognizing the blessing that comes with being obedient to God. My encouragement to you is don't get arrogant because none of us is above succumbing to this kind of temptation or this kind of ideology. So my encouragement is to stay the course, stay faithful. Now, there's another group of you here in the room that as you're hearing me share, you're realizing you have not lived your life by this standard. You have not pursued holiness in your sexuality, maybe just in a recent season or maybe just your entire life. And my hope and encouragement to you is this reminder, Jesus paid for that sin too. The message of the cross is we are no longer defined by our sin and our failures in the past, but when we are in Christ, we are a new creation. So today is the day that you have the opportunity to turn a corner and start living with a different expectation and a different commitment to holiness in your sexuality. Don't allow yourself to be overwhelmed by past failures, to miss out on future freedom. So regardless of where you are, in that spectrum, the question becomes, what are we supposed to do with this? Because all of us can take a step forward. No one here has been perfected in their holiness and has no work left to do. With much of the Christian life, the call to action is not necessarily complicated, but it is difficult. I mean, there's a reason why we are being called to contend for these things. It implies that there's a fight. It implies that there's a struggle that will require intentionality and work. So as you evaluate God's call on your life to be holy in your sexuality, what comes to mind that you may need to change? I've said this before, and I don't think the Lord is in the business of withholding direction from his people. I think more often than not, we're too busy to stop and listen or we lack the courage to obey when we do. So here's what I would encourage you to do today before you go to bed. Pray. Spend a few minutes humbly and honestly asking the Lord what he would call you to do with this command. For the person who stops and asks, I think you'll be shocked at how quickly you get an answer. Ask the Lord to help you to hear the word, not only hear it, but then to actually put it into action. Now, for some of us, the next step is we need to confess, repent, and get accountability. Some of you may have been convicted in these last few minutes of things that you have allowed to become rooted in your life that you need to put off. But if your history tells you anything, it's likely that you're not really good at doing it on your own. Listen, one of the most effective lies that the enemy loves to tell is that you are uniquely sinful, that you are a special kind of failure, that if the people around you knew what it was that you struggled with, they wouldn't love you, they wouldn't like you, they'd be ashamed of you. But that is a lie. Galatians 6.2 calls us as a community to bear one another's burdens in love. This is an outworking of that command. So man, you need to be committed to dragging that sin into the light so that it can actually be dealt with. Tell a friend, tell a life group leader, tell a parent, don't do this alone. Talk to one of your pastors. You have lots of opportunities to do this. Pastor Steve has regularly said, your sin is not safe here, but you are. And that remains true. For some of you, the next step is you've just got to cut out the temptation. There may be things that you just need to altogether cut out of your life. Maybe it's a relationship with someone that you're dating, you're realizing you just can't be trusted to steward that relationship in a way that honors God. So either temporarily or permanently, you may need to cut ties with that relationship. Some of you, maybe it's a relationship with someone at work that's not your spouse, but you know that where it's headed is not a place that would honor him. So it's time to just cut that relationship loose. The question at every step along the way here is, am I more committed to my momentary opportunity for happiness or am I committed to holiness before the Lord? Maybe there are subscriptions or internet access that you can't be trusted with. We may have to go to unnecessary lengths by the world's standard in order to pursue holiness because the world has no standard for holiness. So a couple of really practical tools that I've found to be helpful in my life. Um, Number one, 
uh, is a program called Covenant Eyes. Uh, you probably know what this is already, but it's a, it's a subscription-based accountability software that you install on your phone and on your tablet and on your computer. And it, you set it up with an accountability partner and anything that you look at that is an objectionable or questionable, it'll take a snapshot of it and it will send it to your partner. So it just serves as an added layer of deterrent knowing someone else is gonna see everything I look at and someone loves me enough to ask me the hard questions if something comes up. Another great tool is a program called VidAngel. Um, VidAngel is another subscription-based service that you link to your streaming services. So you attach it to Netflix, you attach it to Prime Video, you attach it to Apple TV, and basically you can filter everything you watch through this program. And you can tell it, here are the words I don't want to hear, here's the images I don't want to see, here's the violence. You can pick and choose what it is that you want to allow on your TV. And I feel like I should give a little disclaimer here. I don't, like the Orff family's not using VidAngel because we're watching all these horrible TV shows that need to be edited greatly. If you're a parent, though, you probably share my experience. I'm just tired of getting ambushed. Or like the worst is all those movies that I watched when I was young, I was like, hey, kids, this would be a great movie. Let's sit down and watch it together. <laughs> and the movie starts you're like, I don't remember half this movie. I'm so sorry. <laughs> it's just a great tool to allow you to sit down and watch a movie with your kids, watch a movie with your spouse, watch a movie with a friend and not be worried about what might ambush you that you don't remember. And now all of a sudden you've got something in your head that you wish you could forget. Another great resource. It's a book called Holy Sexuality and the Gospel by Christopher Yuan. Um, I read this book in preparation for this message. It was massively helpful. He does a much deeper dive into what it means to live a holy sexual life, chastity and singleness, faithfulness in marriage. He also really heavily deals with what it means to be a same-sex attracted Christian who wants to live a holy life before God. So if any of those things are interesting to you or any of those things would be helpful to you, I highly recommend this book. It was a great resource in preparation for today. God's highest desire regarding our sexuality is not that we would be happy. His highest desire is that we would be holy, that we would be sanctified in our sexuality, that we would live a life different from the rest of the world because this is what pleases him and he's the one that wants what's best for us. This is not an easy pursuit, but by the grace of God, we make it our aim to please him. This is the truth of God that we are called to contend for in a sin-broken world, amen? Let's pray. Father, thank you for today. Thank you for your word. Lord, I pray, well, it's the prayer every weekend, Lord, but specifically this weekend, that you would not allow us to distract or numb our conscience to keep us from taking action in response to what you would call us to. I pray, Lord, for us as a church that we would not just be hearers of your word, but that we would be doers of your word. That we would be more concerned with holiness before you than we are with temporary happiness. I pray that your Holy Spirit would do the work that only your Holy Spirit can in convicting our hearts and minds in the areas that we have fallen short. And I pray your Holy Spirit would give us the courage to do the things that are necessary. God, we believe that you will not call us to do anything that you will not empower us to accomplish by the work of your Holy Spirit. So we are desperately reliant on you I pray that you would use this word to bring about change in your people. It's in Christ's name that we pray. Amen. Hey, if you're here today and you don't have a relationship with Jesus or there's someone that you just need to pray with, there's some people down front that would love the opportunity to do that. I also want to remind you as you go, night of worship is Friday night. Uh, we hope to see you there. And our next membership class, if you're not a member, is this Saturday morning. So hope to see you at one or both of those events. Have a great day.